Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 202, Understanding Life Through Story, an interview with Susie Finkbeiner, coming to you on Thursday, June 18th, 2020. So tell me, have any of you taken me up on my idea about doing some writing sprints with your friends? I've actually gotten two more people into my writing sprint group. So now there's four of us. And this morning, my husband and I went out on a run and then we came back and we did a writing sprint with our two friends all over Facebook Messenger. And then we took a shower and had breakfast and went to work. And I was like, oh, this is really good. I like this. <laughs> so tell me, has it been working for you? Have you tried it? If not, try it. It's great. And honestly, no matter how many words you write, one of us only wrote less than 300 in our half an hour sprint. And um, I think there was a certain amount of sadness about it only being a few hundred words. But as I mentioned to them, that's almost 300 words that you didn't have written and wouldn't have written if you hadn't been on a writing sprint this morning. So just be grateful for all the extra words. And uh, over time, you know, it usually improves. And when it doesn't, like with me this morning, I spent my whole half an hour writing down all the plot points in the book that were all messed up and out of order. And I was like, no wonder I don't know what I'm doing when I do a sprint. So hopefully in the next day or two, I'll have the plot kind of sorted out and in order. And then when we do sprints, Hopefully, fingers crossed, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to write a lot more and faster. So just a couple more tips, throwing it out there, encouraging you to get some writing done. Writing sprints work really great. <laughs> Listen, a couple other things that I wanted to let you know. I am going to be with two other fabulous writing women on July 25th. We are holding a one-day online virtual conference called Writing with Hollywood in Mind. My friend Jennifer Dornbush is a screenwriter and forensics expert, and you may remember she was also on the show when her first mystery novel came out. Uh, her agent, Jennifer Gwynn from Seymour Agency, I think, is also going to be with us, and then um, me, the three of us are going to be talking about uh, adding more elements into your books so when you're writing fiction, things that make it seem um, more vibrant, more cinematic, um, better pacing, things that um, might even make somebody reading the book go, it feels like I was watching a movie as I was reading. You've probably read books like that. I love books like that. <laughs> I really thought Ready Player One was like that. I felt like I was seeing it in, as a movie in my head long before they made a movie out of it. So um, we're also going to be talking about how to come up with ideas and what to do with screenplay ideas that will be more likely to be interesting to people who are in charge of buying stories for the large and small screen. And then Julie will be talking about a whole bunch of things having to do with uh, what an agent does in that process. So that'll be a full one day conference on July 25th. And you can find out a little bit more about it through our free webinars that we're going to be doing. So um, Jennifer and I are going to be doing a webinar, a one hour webinar on July 1st, and the exact same one, another one on July 18th, possibly we'll be adding more days. And we'll just be talking a little bit more about um, what we'll be talking about for the whole day on July 25th. So to register for the webinars and then uh, to find out more information and register for the conference, you can just go to my website, rightnowworkshop.com forward slash July 25, J-U-L-Y 25, rightnowworkshop.com forward slash July 25. And you can find more information there. The other thing that I'm excited to be finally starting up, uh, I almost said again, and it is again, but in a different way. So I'm going to be doing a book coaching program, um, tentatively titled at this point, Finish Your Book. <laughs> and that will start on June 29th and run through September 4th. 
And if you are interested, if you're somebody who has been doing a lot of starting but not really finishing, or if you've been wanting to start writing and just haven't quite had time for it, and now you're like, you know, with all the stay-at-home stuff that's been happening with COVID-19 and with it being summer and life maybe having a little bit more time, you might have said to yourself, you know, doggone it, I am going to write that book. So um, also, one more thing, uh, I've got at least one person in the group who is um, has been working on the same book and trying to finish it for a few years. So if you're in any of these categories and you think that what you need is a little bit of coaching, some personal one-on-one coaching with me, and then some group coaching with the whole group, I have three spots left in this class. Um, I say class program, whatever. To me, they're all the same word, meaning we're all going to get together and I'm going to help you. (laughs) So you can send me an email, kitty at kittybuholtz.com. And that's K-I-T-T-Y-B-U-C-H-O-L-T-Z. You should see the the name there in your uh, podcast app or wherever you're watching this. Um, You can Try me on Facebook Messenger, but you know, if we're not already friends, sometimes those messengers go to like a weird spam filter. And I've sometimes found messages in there from two or three years past. So if you don't hear from me in a day or two, you probably should send a message another way. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. Both of those are just Kitty Buholtz. So uh, reach out to me. We have three spots left as of the time that I'm doing this recording, and I would love to help you finish your book. Now, Next, we are talking about story and storytelling with Susie Finkbeiner. I did say at the beginning of the episode, hey, your book just came out two days ago. It was actually a week and two days ago because I got the dates wrong. But this is a really interesting interview with Susie, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. Have a great week. We will remember we're still on summer schedule, so I'll see you again in two weeks. Get some writing done. Let me know whether or not you're getting some sprints done. And meanwhile, here's Susie. Today's guest is Susie Finkbeiner. Susie is the CBA best-selling author of All Manner of Things, as well as A Cup of Dust, A Trail of Crumbs, and A Song of Home. She serves on the Fiction Readers Summit Planning Committee, volunteers her time at Ada Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and speaks at retreats and women's events across the country. Susie and her husband have three children and live in West Michigan. Welcome, Susie. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being here. And I apologize that you have to like hold your mic up close to your face, but the the sound sounds so good. So I'm really excited that it's working. <laughs> I'm glad it is too. <laughs> yeah. So most everybody is, is listening on a, on an iPod app. Uh, I, oh, what am I trying to say? Podcasting app. <laughs> um, but we do have a, a YouTube channel of people, so we can, we can wave hi at the people who are watching on YouTube. <laughs> All right. So first thing, listeners, uh, listeners know that I can't help myself. Whenever I find out somebody lives in Michigan, I say, fellow Michigander, I'm from Michigan. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, right? yay. So are you a Michigan State or are you a Vem fan? Well, I have to say I'm one of those weird people who actually don't care. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> My husband, it's so funny because neither one of us went to either of those schools. We didn't even go to any school in the downstate area. We went, you know, in the in the northern Michigan area. So I think it's really funny that my husband's like, oh, we're totally U of M people. I'm like, we are? Why? <laughs> All my friends went to MSU. <laughs> See, I grew up in Lansing, and so I have to be an MSU fan. That's right. Yeah, I mean, really... Uh, you would probably get kicked out of town if you were a U of M fan in Lansing. My sister was a U of M fan, and she's reformed. But um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> she would wear a U of M shirt when we went to East Lansing. And I was like, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, <laughs> bad, bad girl. <laughs> Well, so for people who are watching on YouTube, and if you're not, um, if you look at the palm of your right hand, that is the map of Lower Michigan. So if I'm holding up my map, (laughs) I live at the top of my pinky. I mean, I'm from uh, like the Traverse City area. And you're over there, bottom of the pinky. (laughs) Yeah, I graduated from uh, Ferris State University, but, um, but in Traverse City. 
Ooh, Traverse. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful, Beautiful town. Not a lot of jobs. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a small problem. <laughs> but we're in Sweden now because my husband works in um, uh, animation for video games and movies, and he's working on a video game over here. Yeah. That's fun. It's very so fun. fun. Yeah. And I'm telling you, Sweden, or at least, so we live in Malmö, the very, almost the very bottom tip of Sweden, right across the bridge from Copenhagen. And I'm telling you, Malmö, to me, which is more or less almost the only part of Sweden I've spent more than, you know, two days. Well, it is. This is a place where I live. So any place else in Sweden that I've seen, I've spent a couple hours or a couple days at the most there. So the only thing I can really speak to is Malmö. Malmö reminds me of Michigan. I feel so at home. It except for the other language. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's difficult. I have to say it's, um, it's getting a little bit easier the longer that I'm here and the more things that I learn. But you know, if you go into a grocery store in Michigan, a regular grocery store, any place in the United States, you have, um, Oh, I forget what it's called. Regular. It's regular flour. What's it called? All purpose flour. Right. Oh, mm-hmm. Yep, um, self-rising flour, and uh, sometimes unbleached flour. And if there's anything else that you needed, they're in small containers in a separate part of the aisle. Yeah. I walk into the aisles of the grocery stores in Melma, and I'm just like, there's a whole bunch of bags that look like flour. It's the, it looks like a flour bag. I don't know what any of them say, and I swear there's 47 of them. Yeah. Oh, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I finally uh, have figured out like how to make whole wheat bread now. You're like this, if it, if it says this on it, this is whole wheat. If it says this on it, this is bread flour. If it says this, whew, but I have to like take pictures of everything and then write it down. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah. But, okay, so we've covered the, hello, Michigan girl, I feel like I need to give you a hug. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so now we need to talk more about you. So um, there's so many things that I could ask you, but why don't I just kind of give you the general question, and then you can kind of go where you want. So tell us, like, how did you start your journey as a writer? Where did it begin? How did it go? Well, you know, I grew up in a storytelling family where my dad was always telling us stories. Some of them were true. (laughs) Some of them weren't quite. Um, And and so there was just always this this emphasis on these are our family stories. These are, you know, different things that happened to your grandfather or great-grandfather all the way back. And my mom was constantly reading to us. And so... It was very natural for me to identify life through story. And so um, I remember when I I would tell stories at school and and they would say I was lying. And I would say, no, I'm just making up a story. Yes. (laughs) I remember uh, that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know I'm not the only writer that started doing that. That's Um, right. And then, you know, in middle school. I found poetry and I wrote really bad poetry about boys. <laughs> a lot of it. <laughs> nice. Um, so glad I don't know where any of those are. And <laughs> um and then I remember in high school a teacher saying, You're good at this. And that just I just thought, well, okay, all right. And then in college, I was in a creative writing course and I went to a very, very small college. And I was the English department, really. (laughs) (laughs) And um, I turned in one story to my professor and he read it right in front of me, which is the most terrifying thing. Yeah. And he said, you need to be doing this. And it just, you know, it was, it was affirmation that I needed. Yeah. From someone other than a family member, someone who didn't have to say nice things. Yeah. And, and so I. I never thought I could make a career of it, you know, because it's crazy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's those, those, nobody actually gets a publishing deal, you know, it, it, one of those things. But then um, I had a pl- 
play published. So I started my career as a playwright. Wow. And, and then one day I thought, well, I'll try to write a novel, but I'm not going to tell anyone because that's crazy pants to write a novel. <laughs> and I didn't even tell my husband at first. <laughs> um, and I realized that that was the expression that my writing needed to take. Nice. So, so it's did a you, long journey. Yeah. Did you yeah. kind of stop writing plays or do you kind of do both a little bit? For my church, I wrote for a monthly sketch comedy show for the kids. Nice. <laughs> um, until that, I really stopped doing that. So I, I still, you know, I think up until two years ago, I was still writing scripts. And um, when I was a little girl, I actually wanted to be a writer for Saturday Night Live. Like what little girl wants that? <laughs> what little girl even knows about Saturday Night Live? I don't know. But um, <laughs> But um, so that kind of filled that sketch for comedy desire to write for that. So I don't anymore. I just don't have time. But yeah. it was so much fun. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Okay. So um, the book that we're celebrating today, at the time that this episode goes live, your book has been out for two whole days. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and so this, the title is Stories That Bind Us, right? Yes, it is. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, this story, it's, it's one of those stories that, that is really close to my heart. So I love it very much. Um, stories That Bind Us is about Betty Sweet, who is a 40-year-old woman who has, has lived the past 20-some years of her life serving her husband um, and, and he's a sweet man, very, very good man. And then unfortunately she becomes a widow very suddenly. And she's in this place of what's my purpose now? What do I do now with my life? And then her sister comes back into her life and Betty has to take care of her nephew, Hugo, who's five years old. And they are both deeply wounded, both grieving the loss of something. And she realizes the, the power of story to heal our hearts. And so it's a, it's a book about, about drawing near to each other through story. Wow. Okay. So this book is set in the 1960s, right? Yes. All right. I was trying to do some math when, when I was reading, well, this shop opened in this year when he was X number of years old and he's X number of years older than her. So, <laughs> so um, I thought it was interesting. And, um, and for me, who, who pretty much reads and writes contemporary, um, I just thought it was an interesting choice. So tell us why the 60s, because this isn't your first book and it's not your last book set in the 1960s. Right. I, I adore the 1960s. <laughs> um, of course, that's my, that's my parents' era. And um, I was raised on Simon and Garfunkel and the Mamas and the Papas and, and all of those and the Beatles and all the, the 60s bands. That's the music I grew up listening to. Um, and I've always been so intrigued by how you know, even in seven years after Kennedy's assassination until 1970, the, the cultural shift in those seven years, the um, just the history that happened in that time, it really was, it was remarkable how much history the baby boomers shoved into those seven years. Wow. Um, and so I've just always been so intrigued by that. and. I remember when I was a teenager wishing that I had been a teenager in the 60s. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, instead, I had the 90s, but the 90s were still cool. But, um, but after growing up and learning more about the 60s and researching it, especially for these books, mm -hmm. I realized that it wasn't an ideal time. Um, no time is ideal. Yeah. And, and it's it's really easy to, to, to look back and say, oh, I wish, I wish I could have been alive then. Um, but to realize that, it, that there were hardships, there was grief 
there was pain in those times too. And um, so I learned a lot writing books set in the 60s. And, and I will say that it's a good excuse to listen to all the music again. <laughs> yes, I would say the music is my favorite part of the 60s. <laughs> yes, and some style, some style. But, um, <laughs> but um, my kids, actually, we listen to the 60s music so much that they can identify which Beatle is singing lead. And I am so proud of that. <laughs> yeah, that is an achievement. <laughs> My husband sometimes asks me, he's like, how do you, I mean, just once in a while and over the last 30 years, he's like, how do you know that that's a remake? I'm like, because I know that song. I know all the words of that song. So that that means that's for sure not, that might be a new song, but it's not the first time that song's ever been done. He's like, but it is a new song. I'm like, if I know all the words to it, honey, it's an old song. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, you know, the 60s to me, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's, actually the 60s wouldn't have been my parents' generation. My brother was born in 59 and my sister in 61. So I really think of it more as, you know, my brother and sister's time. Um, but, and and I remember the clothes and, and I, the clothes do not appeal to me at all. <laughs> but it's funny, you know, just like soaking up history by virtue of um, just the way that you ingest what's going on around you. Uh, I don't think that, I think I would be very surprised about what you were saying, all the things that happened in a seven year period. Like I know about Kennedy. I know about the moonwalk. I know about the Beatles and all the other great music. Like I know about this, this, and this Vietnam, I think started in the sixties. Right. Um, but I don't think I've ever thought of it in terms of how much all was happening in such a small period of time. Was that, um, was it a surprise to you or do you feel like growing up with parents who were storytellers and talked maybe more than mine did, was it not that much of a surprise learning the history? Well, in, I think for me, I knew a lot of it but I had never pieced it all together in the chronolo or chronology of how it, it fit together. Um, you know, just thinking of how in, in 1968, you had the assassination of both Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy. That's a lot in one year. Um, yeah. As well as the, the Vietnam War really, really heating up with the Tet Offensive in January. and um, you know, it was an election year. There, there was so much, um, and I just—it's—it's it's funny though because I I talked to my mom about it, and she's like, "Well, you know, I was in high school, and so she wasn't. You know, they were watching the footage of the Vietnam War, and and she was dating my dad, who was who was headed there. Um, he he oh. was he was um, deployed in 1970, and or yes, 19. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly the year. Yeah. But um, so there was so much going on for her that, that to her, that was just normal that a year would be that busy. And I think that we're living in a time when, when it's, it's, there's a lot going on all the time. Yeah. Um, but we still have to go through our lives and live our lives and wash the dishes and do the laundry on top of all of it. Yeah. So, um, I tell I tell my kids we're we're always living history. We are always living in what will become history, whether you know it or not. Yeah. And and so I think that's as someone who loves history, it's it's intriguing to me how how people live their day to day lives. And I think that's the beauty of writing novels set in history is imagining what it was like to get up every day and go about your life while all of this is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that actually um, explains a, a little bit too, to me of, um, of your, your storytelling style. It, you also love history. I do. I do. Um, a high school teacher, Miss Iverson really woke that up in me. And, um, and just, I, I just love to, to read history books are fine, but I prefer books about about normal people and how they survived it. So, you know, if there's, if there's a memoir of someone at that time, I love reading it because uh -huh. you get more of a sense of what it was really like. Yeah. 
And so do you, did you end up, um, at least for these books, now, sorry, I'm going to take a quick aside. Are your other books set in another period of history or are they contemporary? I have two that are contemporary. My very first, um, Paint Chips and My Mother's Chamomile are contemporary. Um, but then my third, fourth, and fifth are all set in the 30s, which is ah. another time that just... I've, I've always been a little obsessed about. <laughs> so, um, so the Dust Bowl is, it, it is for a cup of dust that's set in the Dust Bowl. And um, that was another where it was, how do people survive when they don't know what's coming every day, when they have no money for food, no money for anything. And on top of that, they're getting a, you know hit with these dust clouds constantly. Yeah. Um, and that was, I, I first heard of my, my grandparents grew up in the depression. So I always heard stories about the great depression in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I read the uh, grapes or the grapes of wrath, I learned that on top of the great depression, there was the dust bowl. And so for 20 years, every time I saw anything about the dust bowl, I grabbed it, read it, watched it, whatever. And my husband was like, when are you going to write your Dust Bowl book? <laughs> and well, okay, I'll write one. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> he is. He is. <laughs> All right. So let's just talk a little bit about the research. Um, can you think of any moments during um, the 30s books or the 60s books where you were like, okay, this isn't working for me because I can't find something that I know must exist or the story that I wanted to tell isn't going to line up with real history. Like, do you have some stories about what you've done when the research and the story needed to come together in a way that you hadn't quite figured out yet? Well, you know, fortunately, not too much of that. Um, but I can think of a few times when I had to radically change a scene because it, it would not have worked. You know, um, my, the thirties books are around a protagonist who is, who's 10 at the very beginning of it and 12 when it ends. So what would she have known? What would she have heard? And the disadvantage of that time is that there's no video. I mean, there's, there's a few, but they're, they're grainy. They're not, they're not great. They're yeah. real, you know, but not of normal people's lives. So having to work within the con confines of they had no money, <laughs> they were stuck in place, I had to, to readjust things. But I think that, that what that taught me was that when you write historical fiction, there are rules. You have to fit the rules of the era. And, and so if you lay them out beforehand, remember, there are no cell phones, there's no TV, there's not, you know. Um, if you prepare for that, it's a lot easier to adjust when you're in that space. Like, okay, that's an excellent tip. You know what? You should just say that again for anybody who's thinking about uh, doing a historical novel. Say that one more time. You set the rules of the era before you start writing, and then it will be easier to adjust when you're in the writing of it. Yeah. So literally, you might have actually made a list. These are all the things I can't use. Yes. Yes. That's and, and brilliant. If you, put, if you put it right at the beginning of your notebook, like tape it in or whatever, then you'll see it. It'll be easier to access um, because it's one thing to write something down. It's another to write it down so you can find it. <laughs> yeah. I am so aware of that, which is how I moved from Word to Scrivener because I was like, there, now I can create all my multiple documents, but have them in one document. <laughs> yes. So you have to, you know, it's a lot of writing I think is, is trial and error, figuring out what works for your process and, um, and listening to other writers to get ideas like use Scrivener or, you know, I'm, I'm more of a physical notebook girl. <laughs> um, but, but having it on hand and, and knowing, nope, I can't, I can't have them do this. It, it is, it's helpful. 
but I had to learn it the hard way. (laughs) All right. Yeah. You know what? We all do. And, and definitely, I just want to encourage anyone who's listening, who maybe is, is working on the first book or perhaps still working on the first book after a long time. This is just, it's part of how you do it. You have to figure out your own way of doing it, which hopefully is why you're listening to the podcast so that you can get lots of ideas for how other people do things things. You try a few, you see what works for you. And sometimes, and tell us, Sarah, if this is um, Susie, I was like, oh my gosh, did I just call her the wrong name? (laughs) Sorry. I've been called Sarah many times in my life. I'll take it. You must, you must look like a Sarah or something. (laughs) I like the name Sarah. It's a good name. Yeah. Okay. So tell us, Susie, have you ever um, had a, a time when you're in the middle of you know, either writing a book that ended up getting published or when you were writing earlier than that, you know, just trying things out where you were like, this process just isn't working for me and I've got to find a way to do something different, better. This happens often. Um, <laughs> I've learned that no, no novel is the same as the last one. They, they all require different things from me. And the process that worked for one might not necessarily work for another. Um, And you know what? I always tell myself, this is normal. That's what I tell myself. Because it's really easy when when you think that, oh my gosh, I'm failing. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm washed up. I'm I'm never gonna be able to write again. Is to remind yourself and, and my my author friends, we say this to each other, oh, remember. This is normal. The resistance you're feeling is normal. Having to having all these false starts, it's normal. Um, and giving yourself some grace in those times, yeah. just to say, it's all right. It's no big deal. Um, I remember when my daughter was in first grade, her first grade teacher would always say, "It's no big deal." And I think that 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 is something that as adults we need to to offer ourselves. It's no big deal. You just, you know, yeah. get up, yeah. wipe yourself off and try again. Try something different. Try writing in a different character's point of view for a minute just to get a palette fresh or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. Or go do the dishes. I've I've found so many times when I'm stuck, I get up, I go do the dishes because there are always dishes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it's kind of like a reset. So when we move physically when we when we go for a walk, when we allow ourselves to go read a book or watch something ridiculous on TV, sometimes it's it, it refreshes our brain, and then we can get back to the work. But but we always have to get back to the work. Yeah, definitely. Don't quit. <laughs> now is not the time. Right. <laughs> oh, you know I don't have kids, but I, I see in your bio that you have three. So I I would guess that this is how parents actually do it. But in my mind, I tell myself, okay, if I had kids and, you know, this term paper wasn't turning out, even though they've done great term papers in the past, but this one just stinks and and it's not working at all. Like, what would I say to them? And I would be like, well, they're my kid and I love them. So of course I would be encouraging and ask them, well, what's a different way that we can look at it? Or so then I try to tell myself, okay, then that's what I should say to me. Like Kitty, it's okay. <laughs> but so tell me, is this part of the way that you, I mean, have you noticed that you will be kinder to yourself when you start thinking about it in terms of, well, if it was my kids, what would I say? Actually, that is, that is exactly the conversation I have with my friend, Jocelyn Green, who is also an author. Um, we will say to each other, please be as kind to you as you are to me. Um, and, and it really, it, it's, it's so soothing to hear that from someone. Um, and we say it to each other all the time. Our deadlines are always opposite each other. So, um, so we're always, you know, going to each other. I can't do this. I can't do this. And and we always, please be as kind to you as you are to me. Um, I think that as humans, we need to hear that. Um, no matter what you're doing, yeah, you you do need to be kind to yourself and understanding, and I'm I'm running into that right now. Um, as you're listening to this, dear listener, hopefully you're not quarantined anymore, but <laughs> we are right now, and so writing is a struggle. 
Um, having the kids home all the time, which I love. I love having my kids here all the time. It's, it's so nice, <laughs> but it is hard. And, and all of the emotional weight of what's going on. And there are a lot of things where people are saying, now is the time to be productive. Maybe, but maybe not. Um, give yourself some, some breathing space. Give yourself some room to feel whatever is going on in your life. Give your time, yourself space to think about it and address it. Because one thing that we can do as fiction writers is, is escape into the novel we're writing. That's not necessarily healthy. Um, we have to address what's going on too, or else we will finish the novel and still have a lot of, of burdens that we need yeah. to address. So we need to address them as they're coming. And, and then maybe put those earbuds in, put some music on and, and see what comes out as the writing. Because while we want to address our emotions in real life, we also can use that emotional energy to write good fiction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is that if um, if you are writing your Dust Bowl story right now, and um, so at the moment that we're talking, uh, you have to be stuck in the house, you could be thinking about, well, so imagine there's a giant dust storm coming. Like, what do I do? do I, I guess I would have to hide in my house and try to put towels around the windows and door frames and stuff. Well, so how would that feel? How do I feel being stuck in my house? And then you can kind of pour it into, even though the situation would be different, you can pour the same kinds of feelings into it, which I, I would think, at least for me, those feelings are much more, um, I don't want to just say stronger, but like really more to the point. Um, then on days when my life is awesome and I have no problems and I'm just kind of breezing by on a, oh, look at all the 5,000 words I got done today because life is easy. <laughs> like, I just wonder if maybe <laughs> those days, I have no idea whether or not the emotions that I'm writing are, are quite as, and again, strong isn't the word, but you know what I mean? Yes, I do. I do. Um, I, I've also, I've, actually been thinking about the Dust Bowl a lot recently because, oh. as you said, it is kind of like, who knows when it's going to hit, you know, the peak of this, and, you know, it's very uncertain. Um, the government is involved, just like it was involved then. People were, were making their own masks back then, just like they're really? making their own masks now. Oh. Um, yeah. And and so I, I think about that, and I'm like, it makes me want to write another Dust Bowl novel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On the side, secretly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the, the novel I'm writing now has to do with the end of the Vietnam War and a lot of uncertainty, a lot of um, difficulty emotionally, and a lot of fear. And so I am able to, to take how we're feeling right now and, and pour that into the novel which has yeah. been helpful. Um, but it, honestly, I could stay at home all the time. I'm, I'm not having a problem with that. It's just, you know, there's this underlying what's going to happen. Yeah. Type yeah. Fear. But, um, and your schedule is different yeah. because you're not alone anymore. You're not sitting there by yourself <laughs> doing your normal schedule, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I wrote my first two novels when they were toddlers. Uh. So I... I can do this. I can do this. Um, and, and I think that for, for those of you who are listening, who are just starting off in this, I think there's this idealist view of we get to go to a cabin and all our meals are magically prepared <laughs> yes. and no one interrupts because they understand how hard it is. And then we get this six figure book deal and all of this, really, it's, it's, it's not making your life fit into the writing. I think that that's the misconception that Hollywood paints for us, is that our lives fit into the writing. No, the writing has to fit into your life. And even Stephen King, he would say, life is more important than the writing. It is. Your family's more important. The people around you are more important. The writing, though, is how you survive living. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so I think that it, 
right now I'm having a, a perspective change about how I use my time and how I I interact with my kids while I'm I'm in the middle of writing and approaching a deadline. And um, they are more important. They always have been. They always will be. My husband is, the people around me, all of that. Um, but I can still get the work done as I'm caring for them. Because yeah. I... Yeah. I can I can chisel out moments and time and everybody has to go to bed at some point. And yeah. I can stay up. <laughs> good point. Good point. You know, and I just want to circle back for a second to something that you said because regardless of um when somebody listens to this episode, maybe uh, it'll be a couple of years from now and this will literally be something that was written about in history and we're into something totally different then. Maybe we'll finally have flying cars. I don't know. Uh <laughs> Probably not, but maybe the self-driving cars will actually work properly and, you know, we'll have a lot more of those. So anything could happen. But along with anything could happen, like you could be in a situation right now where um, someone in your family is sick, really sick, or somebody recently died, or you're sick, or like my husband, I was on a writing retreat getting thousands of beautiful, gorgeous words written when my husband called me on his cell phone to say that, Riding his motorcycle on the way to work, he got hit by a semi. Oh, and he was calling oh. me from the pavement. Yeah, that was <laughs> definitely a game changer. <laughs> and, and it changed the game oh for actually goodness. several years. Yeah, he is, he is awesome now. He's my, he's my Iron Man. He's got a whole bunch of metal in his leg, but he's awesome. So that's all good. But, um, but it does. That, that changes your life for a while. So I thought it was really interesting. I don't think that anyone else has said what you just said, and I tend to kind of gloss over it. So I, I just want to come back to it. You said, and I'm paraphrasing, you make sure that you are taking care of yourself. Figure out what your feelings are. Like spend some time so that you can have a healthy, I'm, now I'm adding to what you're saying, so that you can make sure that you are in a healthy place emotionally, spiritually, physically, you know, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. And then also you can use the writing as a retreat, a place to figure things out, et cetera. Yeah. You know, I, um, this is something Sharon Garlow Brown, who wrote the Sensible Shoes series, um, she talks about a lot is, is sitting with what, what's bothering you and really figuring it out so that you can process it. And sometimes writing is the way to process. I wrote a whole novel after um, being with my husband's grandmother when she died. I had an, a really emotionally difficult time after that. And, and so I turned to writing as a way to process it. And I allowed myself to feel every single emotion as I wrote. And it's actually a book about funeral directors. So, you know, happy, but, um, yeah. but it, it helped me to heal my heart, but it's not that I escaped into the writing. I allowed the writing to pull the emotion out of me so that I had to look at it yeah. and really figure out how, how I, I would move on. And, um, it, it really is, it's good for us. It's good for us. I think that so often, um, I'm an American, so Americans are, you don't cry, you be strong, you, you know, be strong. Weakness is not good. Yeah. Weakness can be a superpower. If we learn how to, to use it to our benefit to serve others through our writing. Yeah, that's beautiful. That is a great way of looking at it because it does take vulnerability that other people might see in you as weakness in order to put all these things down on paper. Mm -hmm. I remember someone saying to me once, you're too sensitive. And yeah. I just said, nope, sensitivity is how, is, is how I do what I do. Yeah. Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with being sensitive or vulnerable or, or admitting that you need help or any of those number of things. And as writers, we are, we're writing emotion. That's really what fiction, you know, we're, we're, demonstrating emotion we're trying to coax our readers to feel as they're reading whether that's feeling something is funny which i love yeah bethany turner i love funny novels yeah um or feeling you know confronting an emotion 
that that they've hidden or you know feeling empathy that's what we want as we're writing we want people to feel something anything yeah, yeah. and so if we're going to do that we also have to feel that um i think it was uh robert frost who said if there are no tears in the writer there will be no tears in the reader and so we have to be feeling people we have to allow that and that can be scary if you're not used to it yeah. um and I, I i get that but it's it's also healthy as a human yeah you know? yeah and and um it, it's so it's so fun to talk about the things that um some of our strengths taken too far can be a weakness some of our weaknesses turned a different way can be a strength and one of the other things i've noticed particularly in the last few months so it's uh early april as you and i are talking and um i find myself uh I, I read a lot of books. I watch a lot of TV. I watch a lot of movies. Like I just ingest story. Uh, I, I almost can't listen to music that doesn't have a story in it. Like I need to know what's going on and who's doing it and how it ends, you know? <laughs> um, but I have found that um, if I get too many um, negative stories in my head and then my imagination takes them and creates even bigger negative stories and then even bigger negative stories. And after a while, I really do have to just sit down and go, okay, Kitty, seriously. Um, what, what it, Einstein, I guess, uh, was the person who said something to the effect of the first thing you have to decide in life is whether or not you think the universe is a good place or a bad place. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. I just heard somebody say that quote again a, a couple of days ago, and I was like, oh, I forgot that, you know, hearing that quote made me go, yeah. And I have to remind myself that the world is a good place where a lot of bad things happen. Like, that's my worldview. And, and I have a whole bunch of other things in my worldview that sometimes I just have to remind myself of. Because otherwise, I can jokingly say, from reading so much YA and dystopian novels, that's okay, everybody, hang in there. Pretty soon, a 17-year-old girl is going to realize <laughs> that she's got the answer. <laughs> Or, you know, it'll be, so what this actually is, is that there was an archaeological dig and they, what they discovered was that something here is actually from aliens from another planet and now it's been released into the air and like my mind can just take it and run wildly with it. And sometimes I just have to remember, you know what, you need to either come back to the real world a little bit, like stop freaking yourself out or if you can't just... Uh, self like self will self control get yourself to settle down then just write something crazy just you know even if it's not what i'm working on i spent a week working on this ridiculous um it was like a chiclet ghost story so the main character uh it's supposed to be funny but the main character dies in the first chapter oh yeah and and she dies pretty brutally because later she finds out she's been murdered and I just had so much fun. Like every terrible thing that I could imagine, I was just pouring into it. And like there were moments when I was laughing and moments when I was crying so bad, I had to like get some tissues because I couldn't see my keyboard. And I was like, I can't do this touch typing thing because I just couldn't see. And, and then other times when I was like, this is going to be a great story. And then when I got it all out of my system, I was like, well, that's not really the story I'm working on right now. So I'll just put it aside and see if I ever get back to it. But it was definitely cathartic. And, um, and I think that it was really emotionally healthy for me. So there's lots of reasons why we might be writing what we're writing and not necessarily, uh, not necessarily every story has to be finished depending on why you started it. I think that's true. And also nothing's wasted, right? Um, so someday you might be riffling through papers and say, oh, oh, I remember this. Yeah. And it could be a chapter or, you know, it could be, <clears throat> excuse me, a full length novel, novel. You never know. Um, the, as a matter of fact, the story that I handed my professor that stood, he, stay here and I'll read it. He, it, it became a chapter in my first novel. <laughs> oh, wow. So nothing is wasted. Um, I have a, a file on my computer that's called scraps. And so I just, keep pushing all the scraps in there and you never know what you might use or, you know, it's a file. What's it going to hurt just to keep yeah. it? But I think you're, you're onto something really, really powerful there when you, when you allow yourself 
just to pour it all out there and get it all out. Um, <clears throat> because if it's something that you need and it, and it helps you process what's going on, we're writers. That's how we figure out the world. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's really good. And, and, you know, turning to story is, is a great way to function and to keep going. Yeah. Um, I think there's no, there's no accident that right now people are craving stories of the helpers, you know, um, there's this whole YouTube channel by John Krasinski from the office. That's just stories that are good. And Aww. people are eating it up like potato chips because they need it. Um, they're, they're thriving on these good stories. And, and that, that to me speaks to the power of story and the responsibility that we have as writers to share good stories that are well-written, well-crafted, and stories that even if they're hard and even if they're sad, they have a nugget of hope. Yeah. Because hope, hope is, is fuel for us as we're surviving different things in life. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's what's so important. You know, you look at any of the, the books that, that last, and usually there's a nugget of hope. I can think of The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Maybe not right now. Maybe not. Don't read that one right now. There's not a whole lot of hope in that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I look at, at so many different stories that have been written throughout the ages. And, and the best ones have at least a little hope in them. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody um, reads you know, different kinds of things. So I think I read a blog post of yours where you were, you were saying, okay, now we're going to go off on a tangent. Hopefully I can remember to come back. <laughs> but uh, you, I think, I read that you will um, pick up books and not read the back cover copy. Just look <laughs> at the cover and be like, yeah, I'll read that. And you have no idea what it's about. Is this true? That is true. And it creeps out my, my um, editor, Kelsey, she, she oh, don't tell me about it. I don't want to hear that. Um, I think that part of that is just, I love being adventurous when I'm reading. Um, and I won't, I don't finish every single book that I start. If it doesn't grab me, you know, life is short. I got to move yeah. on. But um, yeah, I, I don't read the back cover. And I have a friend that writes the back cover copy for books. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't read your work. <laughs> but, oh, um, that would be sad. <laughs> <laughs> she's okay with it. But um, <laughs> just, I, I don't, I don't want to know a single thing going in. Um, if uh, we, I read the Harry Potter books way after they were massively popular. Yeah. And I, it was, it was work to avoid spoilers because I don't want to know right. anything. Yeah. Nothing. So, um, yeah, when I watch a movie, I don't want to know what's, I don't want to know. I want to be surprised. I love being surprised by a story. Um, yeah. And that is kind of one of my readerly confessions is I'll just grab a book and that, that a cover is important. <laughs> it really is important. <laughs> Now, if you had any doubt, people, you know, there are people like, yeah, like Susie, who are just going to pick it up based on the cover. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I, there was one that um, I picked up and I was like, there's a horse on the cover and a pretty tree. And it was a terrifying story. It was great. But it was not what the cover sold it to be. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a cowboy romance. <laughs> oh, no, it was not. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, um, part of the, the thing that I was starting to, to go towards was, um, gosh, I lived in Australia, so it had to have been the early, um, like around the 2009 to 2011 area. And there was this anthropologist that was speaking at a university there. Somehow I ended up being able to hear the recording and he had this amazing 
speech, which, um, which I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how, but I have, I have a portion of this recording, like just a couple of minutes where he's talking about the role of storytellers in, uh, early mankind and how they were as important as important as warriors in just keeping the villagers alive because it was the storyteller who would come and say, yeah, did you not hear? Like there's this village like two days away where a third of them died because of this berry that they ate. And it's like, oh, okay, don't eat the berry. But of course they tell it in a compelling manner. Or um, that there's this crazy saber toothed tiger who's like not acting normal and he's attacking people if they're you know, by themselves outside the village. Oh, okay. Well then we should definitely, you know, or, but, um, the way the, honestly, the way this anthropologist described it, I was like, you dude are a storyteller yourself. I can hear it in the way that you tell us, but it's really important for people to, um, I think that we probably, depending on uh, how we were raised, I think that there's probably an awful lot of learning empathy simply by reading fiction and to some degree nonfiction, like narrative nonfiction, where maybe you didn't really think before about how it would feel to be this person or to be in that situation until you read it and somebody tried to help you explain what this character feels like and you're like, oh. I kind of feel a little bit bad because I think I've been sort of mean to somebody like that. And now I feel like I understand them better. Things like that. What do you think? I think that um, fiction is, it, that's the, that's the beauty of fiction it, and, and narrative nonfiction too. It, it invites you to step into the shoes of someone else. Like Atticus says, um, step into their shoes, walk around for a while. I think that, um, good fiction, the author is putting their arm around you and ushering you through and saying, do you see this? Do you see this? Do you see this? With a very light and tender hand, not, not heavy handed and not preaching at you. Um, fiction that preaches is, is probably not great fiction. Yeah. Um, but it's the, the author taking you around and, and inviting you into this. And when you step out of those shoes, when you close the last page, you are not the same person. Good fiction changes us. It, it transforms us and it empowers us to be better people. Um, and I think that, you know, I, a good example of that is Wonder, the, the, the middle grade book. I just remember the discussions that my kids and I had after we read that together. You know, well, why was Julian like that? Why, why was he mean? Because he had all this other stuff going on. Why, how would it feel to have everyone do this and look at you and, you know, and, and kids are so receptive to it. And um, there are studies actually that the kids who read the Harry Potter books are more compassionate. They, they go on to serve others. They, they look for ways to advocate for others because wow. that's what they learned through those stories is we take care of each other because we're a community. We stand up for the person who can't stand up for themselves. We, we speak truth to power and we do the right thing because that's what we do as people. And I, I just think that that is, that is the power of story. Yeah. And so when we're writing, we can't just say, what's going to thrill the reader? How is this going to impact the reader? Um, is also an important question to ask. Yeah. So, you know, we... It's a big job, but it's a noble job. And, and like so you said, we, we really are as important as anybody else. You know, yeah. I think so often we think of writers as being nerds, which we are. But, um, but we're nerds with conviction. We're nerds with a purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, so I don't know how your family was. You and I grew up within probably 150 miles of each other, probably. Um, my grandparents also, Great Depression, Michigan. So I really only know about the Great Depression as it, as it applies to people in northern Michigan, <laughs> you know, and stuff from history. But um, so um, hold on. What was I just now going to say? Um, it's what you were. I hate it when I do that. I just get so excited, you know, talking to another writer. I'm like, yeah, me too. That's what I think. <laughs> Crap. You just said. <laughs> Writing with thing, conviction, not just to thrill, but to. Yes. 
I was going someplace with that. You know what happens though, is that I think to myself, I'm not editing this out <laughs> because <laughs> listeners want to hear that Kitty just lost her mind again. <laughs> Um, but yes, I was going somewhere along the direction of, um, people, people want to, you know what it is actually exactly like that. I don't edit these bits out because I think that they're funny. Like if I was listening (laughs) to my favorite podcasts, which I have like three or four that I listen to every episode, it makes me laugh. Sometimes I'll be in the gym, you know, like trying to do, you know, the, the things where you lift the weights over your head. I don't even know what it's called, but I know that I need to do them. (laughs) And then, um, you know, James Blatch on the self-publishing show will say something and I just start laughing. I'm like, I can't breathe right when I'm laughing. Stop making me laugh. But I love it. I love it so much. Or Joanna Penn will say something and she'll start laughing at herself. But she has this kind of like giggle that she does when she laughs at herself. And I love it. It just makes me laugh so much when I hear her. And I think that this is the important part about being storytellers. And and I think if there's any other storytellers in our lives uh, at any age, like we all also need to be the the encouraging person who says things like what you just said, Susie. Like this is an important job. We help people. And whether we're helping people by helping them like escape a hard day or get through something difficult or just being entertaining because like I've got some time and I just want to laugh for a little bit or, or be entertained. Like your books, um, as far as I can tell, your books are very lyrical. They're not, you know, we were just talking about um, Bethany Turner and her one wonderful, funny books, but your books are, are more of this kind of lyrical, almost poetic sound to them. So we're, we're helping people to get through all sorts of things, um, enjoying, enjoying the story, um, getting something from it, even if they're maybe not totally realizing what they're learning or getting from it. And also just um, books are a fabulous escape when you're like, life sucks right now for this and that reason. Yeah. So, yeah, I just feel that way about podcasts and movies and TV and books and the whole thing. Well, you know, I, I, I like to um, sometimes pull the curtain aside and say, look at what it's like, you know, um, because with writers, there is that Hollywood notion of what we're like. And, you know, we're not like that. Yeah. The first draft is not the perfect one that gets sent in to the agent who immediately signs us and gets us a book deal. Right. No, no. <laughs> the first draft is stinky and nobody should ever see it. I don't even want to look at my first draft. I used to, when I um, first started off, I would print them to edit them. And then I realized how expensive that gets. <laughs> yeah. But um, I would literally burn the first draft because I was so afraid that someone would find it after I died and think, oh, it's another book because it's so drastically different from the finished product. <laughs> and that's what happened with Harper Lee um, with Ghost of a Watchman. It was a draft of To Kill a Mockingbird and someone found it and thought we should publish this. I did not know it was a draft of the first of the book that made her famous. Yeah. Oh, so well, that would was, be embarrassing because I don't think it got that great of reviews. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. Um, it was definitely Harper Lee's work, but, yeah. um, but you, it wasn't, it was it didn't have the magic, but yeah. the thing with that one is she presented it with, with, um, Scout being an adult telling uh-huh. the story. And the editor said, I kind of want to hear it from a little girl's perspective. And so she rewrote it. And that was, yeah. Atticus is vastly different in To Kill a Mockingbird. He's his lovable self, but, um, I don't, I didn't want that to happen. So I would just burn. (laughs) (laughs) And it was actually very cathartic just to toss it in. And because you can't toss the whole thing and you have to do it little by little. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Oh, that's very funny. All right. Now you make me really want to, I've got a whole shelf of notebooks down here. That's like this version of that book and this version of that book. And I kept them because they're covered in notes and stickies and highlighting and circles and just all sorts of things. And I thought, you know, sometime I might want to teach a class on this or on that or the other thing. And I'll have these already marked up, you know, things to use as examples, like look how bad it can be, or look how I was like circling 14 wuzzes on one page or, you know, but now I feel like I need to go put sticky notes on every single notebook saying, this is a draft, burn if I die. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, 
oh. it's not a bad idea. I, you I do not have permission to publish this. That's right. No matter what. <laughs> especially in the digital age where now we can make everything last forever. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah. very true. <laughs> oh, wow. This has been so much fun. Thank you for taking the time. I know that uh, we're sort of interrupting both writer time and family time at nine o'clock in the morning for you, but thank you. thank you. Oh, thank you. This has been so much fun. I love talking to fellow writers and just talking shop. It's so right? much fun for me. I know, me too. Okay, now people might be um, wondering about these Dust Bowl books and the brand new one, Stories That Bind Us, and maybe some of your other books. So where can people find you and your books online or, or wherever you want to say? They can find me at suzyfinkbinder.com. Um, good luck spelling it. <laughs> Just think German. You'll find it. <laughs> there you go. Um, and... They can also find me on Instagram. Instagram is a great place. I post every book I read. I post a picture of it with a, a tiny snippet. Um, they can also find me on Facebook at Susie Finkbeiner. Excellent. I will spell that out and put links in the show notes. So if you're listening on your podcast app, just go to the show notes. I'll have it all spelled out for you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, Susie, thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure talking to you today. Oh, thank you. And thank you for, for hosting this, for, for writers to listen to and be encouraged and to, to learn more about their craft.